Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Facebook Live event. My name is Kevin Bradley, and tonight we're going to talk about creating a sleep environment that's conducive to a restful night's sleep. So I think we all have experienced, or I'm sure a lot of people that are here have experienced insomnia, um, that time where you're Basically, the sleep is interrupted. All night sleep. I do notice that there's times where I think I apologize that I feel like I'm going off air, so I hope it's not too problematic. Um, I'd like to have this. Uh, tonight's talk more interactive so please if you want to um, clarify something or add comments again I always encourage that because within groups it helps each other um, it helps fuel conversation sharing experiences is always good and um, a lot of people think they're alone in this uh, again there's nothing worse than waking up in the, the dead of the night and not being able to sleep so we'll go through a couple of things. I have some um, little pointers here, but again, I encourage your, your comments. Um, I think we all know that, you know, avoiding caffeine uh, too close to going to bed is, is key. Um, I myself love my coffee in the morning, but try and limit it after, say, around two or three in the afternoon would be the latest I would have a coffee. Um, to be um, aware that caffeine can be, of course, in tea, um, chocolate and cocoa products. So these are things that you should also be mindful that you shouldn't really be consuming too close to going to bed. Again, you know, sometimes people th feel like they want that cup of tea or a hot drink. Uh, in reading some of the things regarding this tonight's talk, I, I did find that a lot of people, of course, are using herbal teas like with chamomile. Um, some teas have, you know, calming effects with lavender induced in them. And people have found great experience using these products, just having that warm drink before going to bed. I think, again, regarding coffee, again, we all know it's a stimulant. Um, but we also have to talk about other stimulants. If you're a smoker, um, stop. <laughs> um, but if you do, um, it's best not to smoke at least a couple of hours before you go to bed because, again, that's a stimulant. Some people, and I've heard before, need a couple of glasses of wine and they feel that it helps them relax at night. That's certainly some people's habit, and um, I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. But, again, be mindful of the amount of alcohol that you consume before going to bed. People may think that it helps them sleep quicker. And yes, that can be true. But then when the alcohol processes during the night, about two or three, four hours later, and you start to metabolize it, it's then that you get access. Some of these can also, like alcohol or um, smoking, can lead to indigestion. That can be a big problem if you've got a reflux, for example, um, or a reflux disease. You know, you're not you're going to throw up, for example, and you're not going to get a good restful night's sleep. So alcohol can contribute to that. So again, be mindful to avoid consuming large quantities um, at least a few hours before going to sleep. Now, when I talk about this as well, I think about my sleep environment. And, you know, your bedroom is really important. Um, I myself um, like to keep the bedroom cool. There's nothing worse, and, and certainly I've been south of the border or, you know, below the equator in a warmer climate, and it's just so difficult at times without air conditioning, for example, to try and get a restful night's sleep. It's always better, I think, if you have a cooler environment. And I've read anywhere from 65 to 75 degrees. I sort of felt like 75 was a little bit hot, but some people, it's a personal choice. Uh, but again, I think people's experiences, like they'll get to sleep a lot quicker when it's a bit cooler and then they feel they can snuggle underneath a quilt or a cover or sheets. 
Other things, of course, are um, keeping light out. Some people are unfortunate enough to live beside somewhere where maybe they have street lights out their bedroom window or it's a noisy street. So for the lighting situation, I always advocate that people have good shades or curtains at night so that they can block out that light that's coming through. Another thing I sort of seen uh, reading on this is like in the morning, it's probably a good idea to, of course, to let the light in. There's something I'm considering and it could be like time shades where they go out at night or go down at night and at sunrise they come up. Uh, so that can be helpful as well, just to keep that body clock going. Again, noise can be a problem. Some people use earplugs. Others uh, like white noise. I myself have a fan, um, and it um, is a little bit noisy, not too much, but it just has that little hum that, that takes away the outside noise. I'm not a big fan of earplugs, and I think I inadvertently pulled them out, but some people it works for, um, and others, you know, they have um, a fan, or I used to have like an extractor fan or cooling agent, which also cleaned the air. That was a little bit too noisy, but it, it actually helped me sleep a little bit better as well, just listening to that and tuning into that um, noise. Of course, some people listen to tapes at night or music or light meditative state music, um, and that's fine too. There's plenty of apps out there that you can download that um, play that uh, an hour or two before you go to bed and then stop during the night. Now, one of the other things as well for your sleep environment is I always like to keep my room clean, <laughs> tidy, um, my sheets clean, of course, and uh, fresh. So when we think about the bedroom, you have to get it into your mindset that your bedroom is for sleep. It's hard when people maybe sit on their bed and do work, for example, use their laptop. That can, you know, change the mind's brain to think that, you know, you're in the bedroom and it's not really for that. I did read an interesting article and really the bedroom should be for sex and sleep. So uh, that's how we should do it. I think as well, when we look about the bedroom, I always, again, state. I regard my bedroom as my little sanctuary and I like to keep it you know perfect for that environment where I can just get a restful night's sleep. I'm actually going to look because I do see some comments before I go any further and unfortunately I need my glasses um, and I do see some comments. Thank you Justine and uh, I know too much wine can really interrupt sleep so that's thank you for sharing that. Um, and you know, like you said too, Justine, work in bed does make it hard to fall asleep. Some people at night, before they go to bed, they'll check their laptop, they look at their computer, they check their phone. It's, it's difficult because again, you know, you should teach your brain to feel like your bedroom is just for sleep only and that's your sanctuary. And work should be done somewhere else. So that when you arrive in your bedroom and you're ready for sleep, your mindset is already focused and getting ready for that sleep activity, okay? Um, and, and again, it's difficult, but you know, some people do like to work and then it, it feels like it makes them sleep. Uh, but again, I feel that it should be just for that purpose only. Now, this is another topic that I looked at and we, we did chuckle about this. Um, some of us have pets. And um, I was never a big fan of having my pet in the bed, but I have like a six pound chihuahua. So, you know, after a while he gets into the bed and um, I will admit that sometimes he snuggles up against my back. Sometimes he's, you know, across the bed, in the bed, out of the bed. So, I mean, if that happens and it's disrupting your sleep a lot, then maybe it's time for Fido to sleep in his own bed. I know that's easier said than done, and there's no way that I can have Rio sleep anywhere else other than the bed. 
So it is something I'm just going to have to live with, but um, he actually doesn't disrupt my sleep too much. But again, be mindful if you have a larger pet, for example, or some people I know, a friend of mine has three dogs sleeping in their bed, and they're actually big dogs. Uh, so I don't know how her and her case that you know maybe it's time to change that routine and and have your pet sleep on in their own bed. Now again, when we talk about things, we you know getting ready for sleep. It, some people look at it as a ritual. Uh, people go have a bath at night. Some people like to just relax, uh, get themselves ready actually for the next day. Get into their night clothes or their PJs. And it's also getting that mindset as well ready for sleep. Some people as well like to read. I find that if I read at night, it makes me drowsy and I'll fall asleep. Now, the big thing is, and I, again, I'm guilty of this, we do have a TV in our bedroom. And there's some times where we'll sit and watch a movie and um, try then and, and go to sleep. But I, I like to break that routine from watching the movie to then preparing to go to bed, as opposed to turning off the movie or the program I'm watching and then trying to fall asleep. Of course, some people, and I know it's a personal thing here, but some people actually like the TV or a little bit of sound, and it helps them go to sleep. But, I mean, researchers have found that blue light that is emitted from the TV can actually stimulate the brain, and it can leave a restful environment. Uh, again, I'm going to look at some of the comments, and um, thank you again for... Um, your, your input. Um, you know, there's other things that people have said is go to bed when you're truly tired. Now, it sort of contradicts some of the things that I've read because, you know, it does say try and get into your routine. Um, routines are always good. And of course, we always think of routines being hard to break. So therefore, if you do get into your routine, hopefully that'll be hard to break. But the reason I'm saying that is because they're saying, you know, some of the things I've read, go to bed when you're truly tired. Well, sometimes that's not the case because maybe you don't feel like going to bed, maybe you're not tired, but you do realize that you've got an early start or an early meeting in the morning and you really need to get that restful sleep. I myself, I think I'm guilty of maybe staying up a little bit too late. Um, and, you know, I think if I try and get into a routine of going to bed at a certain amount of time or a certain time every night and then waking up every morning at the same time, our, my body will get used to, to a better pattern. Now, that leads to another situation is the weekend. If you work Monday to Friday like myself, uh, the weekends for me, I'm like, yeah, it's Friday. I don't have to get up in the morning. I can stay and watch a movie or go out and have dinner late and then come home and you know so it's it leads to that like sleep pattern that's disrupted so what happens of course on saturday morning is i would tend to lay in bed i'm not getting up at like quarter to seven for example i'm laying in bed a little bit later and sometimes then you know i i might nap again during the day because it's saturday and i've nothing to do for example and then, of course, I'm into that pattern as well where Saturday night, I'm not working Sunday, and I'm staying up late again. So some people experience that Monday morning hangover, and I certainly have. Sometimes the worst sleep that I've had is a Sunday night. And I used to put it down to the anticipation of, oh, it's Monday morning, I'm starting the week, you know, the Monday blues, and I, you know, clock watch, and it's horrible. but this has been great for me looking up uh, and researching this for tonight's talk because I realize now that I actually should be sticking to a better routine. I'm not saying go to bed every night, you know, by 10 and up at 7 and, you know, I can't have fun at the weekends because, you know, that's what weekends can be for or your days off. But I want to be more mindful of the fact that I can't push it too much further. And I want to try and get into a pattern where this won't disrupt my sleep and lead to that Monday morning hangover that I've been experiencing um, for the last few months. 
So it's the winter here in Canada, and um, I do feel that, you know, with the brighter nights, especially when it comes into the summer, I tend to stay up a little bit earlier, or later, sorry. But in the same token, I find then in the summer mornings, I'm more, more, I have more incentive to get up earlier as well. This leads me now to exercise. So I actually thought that maybe exercising closer to bedtime was a, a good thing. Uh, I thought, wow, it'll make me tired. You know, I might feel like, okay, I'm ready for sleep now. But anything I've read is actually contradictory to that. And certainly in the, the better weather in the mornings, again, I'm more inclined to get up earlier. So I'd rather do my run in the morning or go on the treadmill at the gym in my condo. And sometimes in the winter nights, I've done that later at night. But of course, that stimulates me as well. And, and, and I feel like maybe that's why I wasn't sleeping so restful. So again, the recommendation for that is, you know, it's most likely better to not exercise too close to going to bed. And the recommendations were anything from four to five hours. If you want to run in the evening, do it, but do that early. Speaking of which, again, sometimes um, I find in the winter nights and the dark evenings, which are always problematic, and I find that's the time where I feel more tired. If I'm leaving work in the morning and it's dark, and I'm getting home and it's dark, all I want to do when I come back from work is have a nap. Now, even though since I've started my CPAP therapy and I feel I'm getting more restful sleep, I do find that sometimes I just need that 20 minute shot. I, I think for me, it's actually relaxing to just come back from work and just cut off from the world and um, have a little nap. Again, the recommendations is not napping too long. Uh, 20 minutes is usually what I set my alarm for, 30 max. And again, not too close to when you'll go to bed. The recommendations as well is nap. If you're going to nap, no later than 5 p.m. That's not always practical when you have a 95 job. I'm sort of lucky that usually I'm home by 4.30. So sometimes I'll just go into my room and, and just, actually I may not sleep, but just being in my bed and closing my eyes and having what we used to call a disco nap helps me tremendously. Now there's been situations where I have napped and um, set the alarm clock and constantly hit the snooze button because I have been overtired and didn't realize it or I've slept maybe for an hour. And then you get into that pattern where you don't feel like you want to go to bed at a reasonable time that night because you've napped so long. And then you wake up tired and then the same thing happens. So, you know, that's a habit that needs to be broken as well. So if it's part of your routine and naps are great, but um, if it's part of your routine, just be mindful of the fact of do it early and not too long. This also leads me to thinking about, you know, different cultures and how sleep's perceived around the world. And I think definitely in different cultures, different climates, wherever you are in the world, it is different. It's great when you go to Europe and um, because of the heat, generally, you know, mid-afternoon, everybody's away and places are locked down and they have a siesta. I'm all for that. It's great. You're avoiding that high temperature and that's why they've done that. Um, and, and people just close themselves in in a dark, cool environment and, and rest. Teresa, thankfully, actually sent me, and thank you, Teresa, an article about Victorian sleep, which was very interesting, um, and people should check it out. It's basically, you know, before pre-industrial times, before electricity became a part of our own everyday livelihood, people would generally go to bed when it got dark. But then they'd wake up in the morning, and first thing in the morning, they would do their chores, do housework, get things organized, but then actually go back to sleep again. And this isn't a bad thing, because they call that the biphasic phase of sleep. So people would actually have a, get up in the morning, again, do some work, go back. It's almost like having a really good nap for another couple of hours before they start their day. People found that now they're doing this and it helps their, their memory, 
um, their cognitive ability, um, and actually just get more restful sleep. Something, you know, is to be considered if you are in a climate or somewhere where, like me, when the dark evenings are in, maybe I will go to bed early, get up early, do some things and have a great little sleep an hour or two before going to work. When I was younger and I'd done that a lot, I used to love going back to bed. There was a great feeling of getting up, doing some things, and then just getting back to bed for that other hour. It's a great feeling. So I'm off for that. Thank you, Teresa. Now, if you're like me and I talk about my Sunday night sleep habits, and, and sometimes that's really difficult, I have found that, you know, I do have an alarm clock, obviously, or, you know, I use my phone and an alarm clock beside my bed. I have it right dimmed down. But there's nothing worse than clock watching if you can't sleep. So if you do have insomnia, it's better to put the clock away. And it's happened to me where, you know, I wake up at maybe two o'clock in the morning and then I wake up, it's 20 minutes to three. And then I wake up, it's 10 past three. And it just, it, it creates anxiety because you keep feeling like, oh, I'm up in four hours or I'm up, you know, in five hours and it's terrible. I need to sleep. And then there's something about that clock going off at quarter to seven and you feel like I just slept. I feel like I just slept at 630. So if that happens, you try not to watch the clock. Just don't even think about it. Put the clock away, turn it away, and you know it'll lead to less anxiety. Now, if you are unfortunate enough, like sometimes it does happen to me, where you do wake up in the middle of the night, it's best to actually leave your bedroom. Go out into the living room or somewhere, maybe have something like a glass of milk and some crackers is okay. Um, but keep the lights dim as well. Don't have anything that's too stimulating. And maybe sit on your sofa and read a book or close your eyes and try and relax until the point where you feel tired again. And then you can make it back into your bedroom and, and try and get a restful night's sleep. So it has happened to me where I just feel like I need to get out of the bed because I feel like I'm just tossing and turning. So it's helped me when I've left that environment and just sort of try and be peaceful, relax, maybe open the magazine and read something that's not too stimulating. And then I feel tired again. And at that point, I went back to bed and, and usually I do fall asleep. So again, you know, when we talk about um, the preparation for sleep, one of the biggest problems is um, for a lot of people is waking up in the middle of the night to pass urine. So this is regarded as nocturia. And nocturia is um, basically when you have to get up at least twice during the night to pass urine, go to the bathroom. So if that's your case, obviously, you know, the, the thing is to avoid fluids before you go to bed. Now, there's a balance there because some people then complain that they wake up thirsty in the middle of the night. That can be another indication that maybe you're a bit dehydrated or, of course, you're breathing through your mouth, which is not great. But the problem of waking up to pass urine can lead to a lot of people's disruptive sleep. Now, if this is a consistent problem for you, and it is more than twice a night, which is excessive, um, go seek help and see your family doctor and just let them know that this is a problem. I think, you know, we, we talked about this the other night and um, I think a lot of people just think that, you know, this is the norm for me. I'm older. This is just what happens. But again, some of these things can be a symptom of something else, something simple or something more serious. So again, discuss it with your doctor and let them know that, this is A, disrupting your sleep, and B, you know, you're, you're getting up to pass urine at least two or three times a night, and um, they'll do some investigations and, and um, figure out what's going on. So when we look at that again, um, some of the other things that cause people to wake up, like I said, is being too hot, too cold. So it's getting that right, that right space and environment for yourself so that you're okay. Sometimes when I feel it's the dead of the winter here, I still like to keep the heat very, very minimal. Um, but if I feel then I wake up during the night, 
I have a sheet at the bottom of my bed that I can pull up that if I feel I get cooler at night, it's something that can help me out. Um, some of the other things that we, you know, discussed and, and I read, and, and it's always the same. We all have woes. We all have worries. Um, our jobs can be demanding. Sometimes I'm lying in bed already thinking about what I need to do the next day. Uh, so what I found useful for me is before I go to bed, I write down or I put it in my phone out of the bedroom, um, a plan for what I need to take care of during the day. Now, that's not always great and it's not always possible because sometimes when we're in that relaxed state, some things do come to mind and I'm like, oh, I have to go to the store tomorrow and get coffee or milk or I have to go and meet that person or I need to get ready for my Facebook Live. <laughs> so some of these things that you do, it's, it's great to write it down and then put it away. Now, if you are in a situation as well where you have anxiety on board or, you know, something that's really troubling you, it's good advice to write those down, write your woes down. And again, put it in a box, put it in the paper, out of the bedroom, think things through, and then just say you're going to leave it there. Because if you take it to you with the bedroom, in the bedroom, it's going to just lead to a really, really restless sleep. Easier said than done, I know. But um, I mean, it's good advice and it's worked for me regarding work. Now, some other people keep a sleep diary. Again, there's um, some people as well like to, you know, write down and, and have a routine. It's almost like, you know, when you're planning a diet, for example, you want a meal plan and you say what you're eating and, and what you're drinking and what you're taking in and what you're exercising. It's, it's not too bad to keep a good sleep diary as well, specifically if you're not sleeping well. And maybe write that down. And after a period of time of over a month, for example, look at that and see if there's something that's contributing to the lack of sleep, the insomnia, the disruptiveness. Um, write down what you've eaten that night, what you've had to drink, when was your last coffee, for example, and take this seriously. And then look at it yourself and reflect and see if there's a pattern. People have found that really helpful. And if you feel maybe there's not a specific pattern, then maybe it's an idea to go and talk to one of your healthcare practitioners and actually show them your diary and say, here's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do the right things. And um, this is what's happening. Now, of course, this leads to another topic and it's sleep aids. And many people use sleep aids. There was a research um, article that I read. It's not too well validated because it was a small sleep study of less than or just over a thousand people. But it actually said it surprised me that less people were using um, prescription medications to fall asleep. And most were using things like, you know, chamomile or, or relaxing teas. Aromatherapy was big on the list as well, and I've certainly um, used that. Trees adjusting and myself were talking, and again, um, I, I heard maybe the possibility of some people thinking that they could put aromatherapy drops into the um, humidifier of your sleep pad machine, and that's, that's a no-no. Um, if you want to use aromatherapy, get yourself a good infuser so that you have that calming like lavender um, or chamomile, you have that lavender scent in your room that can help relax people. Um, again, going back to even over-the-counter uh, medication, some people use things with Benadryl in them, for example, and all these things are not great. You should actually just look at the real cause of what's causing your disruptive sleep as opposed to depending on something. Um, obviously, the prescription medications can be habit forming and, and you don't want to get into that cycle. So try and use things that you can do as opposed to medication. Again, some people when I read in that research study were using things like even hot milk and a few crackers, um, something with a little bit of carbohydrate and something that's easily digestible and something with a bit of protein um, just help them sleep. 
a bath before, again, like I said, can help people and, and just get them into that mode. So I am going to look again and um, see if anybody has any um, questions or comments. And I do see, yeah, keep your cell phone, laptop out of the bedroom. That's a good comment and keep them downstairs. Um, I like that one as well because we're all inclined to keep looking at our phones and checking things and writing notes. And again, that can, that can stimulate the brain. Um, so if anybody wants to comment on this or have questions, um, please feel free. Uh, we want to make this again more interactive. I'd also like to, you know, and appreciate your comments and, and um, feedback about further topics that you'd like to hear. And, um, you know, again, we might have other speakers come on here and discuss things with you that you, you feel are important and that you want to know. Uh, what I was remiss in saying, of course, if you are a CPAP user, be adherent to your therapy. And if you're not, seek advice about how you can, because that's actually been my number one lifesaver and um, number one thing that's helped me get a restful night's sleep, having that mask on and, and feeling that I can lay in bed and not uh, wake up gasping for air. So if anybody has anything else, I'd appreciate um, before we log off. Um, I'm just looking. So, yeah, Maureen Murphy, um, DeSanto, I, I appreciate that because that's a topic I wanted to talk about. She suggested the easiest way of cleaning your equipment. Um, I was very happy one time when I went to my sleep study clinic, which I do every six months, and they checked my machine, and they were like, wow, this is the cleanest we've seen all day. So I was happy with that. I, I would be happy to talk about that. I think it's an important topic. And um, it's a great one because, um, you know, you're breathing in what's in that machine. So it needs to be kept really clean. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Marcy, when you're saying how can you. Maybe you mean log times up and down during the night. You don't know when you finally fall asleep. That's true. And it's a good point. But if you wake up and you write down the time um, and you get out of bed, then maybe it's good. You're not sure when you fall asleep. But I think even logging that disruptive sleep um, and maybe even thinking about an approximate how long you were awake could help as well. Um, you know, it's a great point, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this, and again, I don't want to take up too much longer. But, but um, it's very important as well, and I, I, I was totally um, into this years ago when I was fortunate enough, it's all tax season now, and I got some tax money back, and, and I thought, I'm buying a good mattress. Expensive, yes, uh, but once you get one, that's it. You'll never go back to, you know, a crummy old mattress. So that's important. As well as I mentioned, the sheets, a pillow is good, and how many pillows you need, soft, two, one, three, hard, whatever suits yourself is all great. But think about a mattress and um, try it out. Uh, most mattresses now these days are great because they come back with a money back guarantee, basically, or a return after 30 days of sleep, which is, I think, marvelous. So if you have the means and the finances and, and you feel it's time, uh, they say mattresses last, what, eight to ten years. So um, invest in a good mattress this is, that's comfortable for you. Um, so, okay, I hope you guys find that useful. Um, we will be back with more topics, and we look forward to seeing as many people as possible. I also wanted to mention that, you know, we will take some questions and comments even after this has gone, um, gone or finished, sorry. So feel free to comment or ask questions and share your experiences. And again, uh, my name's Kevin. I want to thank you guys for being here tonight and wish you all a restful night's sleep. All right, take care until the next time. Bye-bye.